Okay, Keen, I think we are live. Okay, outstanding. So, do you could go ahead and uh, take the PowerPoint down for the uh, uh, time being. Um, you know, I'll wait for you to do that. Well, hello. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first of what hopefully will be uh, more than one uh, meeting of the advisory uh, committee uh, for the Fallbrook uh, PUD and Rainbow Municipal Water District reorganization proposals. Uh, calling to order our meeting on July 6th, uh, Monday. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do a roll call through Tammy and members, uh, and there are 10 of you. Uh, when your name is uh, uh, announced, if you'd be kind enough to provide your title and uh, your agency affiliation, again, for the record, this is being live streamed on YouTube. And those who are watching on YouTube uh, right now, uh, you are certainly uh, welcome to provide uh, live comments via email. Uh, instructions are on our agenda, and we're going to get to that item uh, shortly. But just as a promise, and I'm going to ask uh, Tammy to remind me of this promise, at the end of our agenda, I'm going to come back to see if there are any other public comments received by email, and we'll address those uh, as well. Uh, so. Uh, with that said, Tammy, if you could go ahead and do roll call for our 10 committee members, and then I'll uh, do a little introduction of staff. Tom Kennedy. I'm, I'm here. Yeah. I'm the general manager at Rainbow Industrial Water District. I also represent Rainbow as a board member at the San Diego County Water Authority and on the San Diego Laughter Local Agents Formation Commission. I mean, um, Special District Advisory Committee. Sorry. Jack Beebe. Uh, here, uh, General Manager Fallbrook, PUD. Sandy Curl. Here, um, Sandy Curl, General Manager of San Diego County Water Authority. Nick Cantus. Yes, Nick Cantus is here. I'm the Deputy General Manager with the Eastern Municipal Water District. Lydia Romero. I'm Lydia Romero. I'm the City Manager of the City of Lemon Grove. Kimberly Thorner. Here, uh, general manager of Olivenheim Municipal Water District, also the chair of the special district's LAFCO advisory committee. Gary Croucher. I'm here, I'm a uh, recently retired division chief with CAL FIRE, but I represent both the County Water Authority as the vice chair and Otai Water District as their president. And I'm a past member of the Special Districts Advisory Committee to LAPCO. David Sherishore. Present or no? He's muted. David. David Sherishore, City 10 member, City of San Diego, and board member, San Diego County Water Authority. Brian Albright. Present. I'm with the County of San Diego, uh, formerly Director of Public Works, currently uh, Director of Parks and Recreation. Rachel Cortese. Hi, I'm a Senior Demographer and Land Use Modeler at Sandag. So ends roll call. All right, outstanding. So we have all 10 members, so we already have some success going. So let me uh, quickly introduce uh, the LAFCO staff uh, many of you already know uh, some of the faces. I think uh, through this process, uh, you will uh, get to know all of them uh, that much more. I'm going to start with uh, Commission Counsel Holly Watley, who's down in the corner of your screen with the map of the world uh, behind her. Uh, Robert Berry uh, is our Chief Policy Analyst. Uh, Robert is also going to be the Project Manager on these two uh, reorganization proposals, and you're going to hear from him in just a bit. Uh, Tammy uh, Luckett, you've already uh, heard our commission clerk. Uh, Linda Heckenkamp uh, who, uh, is uh, our analyst and also assisting today uh, with uh, Du Nu. Uh, du, of course, is uh, uh, signed up to be our GIS person, but COVID has asked him uh, to expand his responsibilities and now become our chief IT and Zoom officer, so thank you, Du, for all your good work. Uh, Erica uh, Blum is uh, uh, on your screen. Uh, Erica 
is our uh, administrative assistant, and also uh, people in the public will be your uh, uh, email contact should you have uh, comments to provide uh, during this and future uh, meetings of the advisory committee. And then I don't know if I see Ruth uh, up on the screen or she's calling in, but Ruth is our executive assistant and helps me with all sorts uh, of things. So uh, that is the LAFCO team uh, as it is. Uh, at this point, we're going to move down onto our agenda uh, under public comment. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we are being live streamed on YouTube. Uh, so for those who are watching and who would like to submit a comment uh, on the advisory committee's work, uh, it's pretty open-ended given we don't have any specific agenda items today, so you kind of have free reign on your observations to offer us. Uh, please do so. Uh, if we get them uh, um, uh, right now, uh, we will read them into the record via Erica. And again, you can do that by following the instructions on the agenda cover in emailing your comments uh, to Erica, uh, erica.blum at uh, sdcounty.ca.gov. And again, the, the specific email address is on the agenda cover. I do know Erica had received uh, two written comments before the start of the meeting. Uh, committee members, you hopefully have uh, gotten uh, both of these comment letters in your inbox this morning. Uh, one from uh, Mark uh, Muir, uh, former uh, chair of the San Diego County Water Authority, also a uh, council member for the city of Encinitas. I will just simply summarize that Mr. Muir has um, uh, is encouraging that LAFCO uh, use uh, some consultants to dive into some of the uh, key details of these reorganization proposals. And I think we might uh, talk about that uh, very topic uh, at the very end uh, of our meeting uh, and also uh, to take into account uh, the dynamics of COVID as it relates to the water authority and met water supply processes. Uh, so. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark, for those comments. And then separately, uh, we had comments from Rodney Smith, a uh, private citizen uh, who uh, wants uh, additional uh, details and attention uh, to the issues of uh, water supply reliability and rates, uh, specifically between the Water Authority, San Diego County Water Authority, uh, and then the Metropolitan Water District. And as all of you know, and I'm certainly will be a key a facet of Robert's analysis into this proposal. Uh, while not a direct uh, party to this uh, uh, proposal, uh, the water supply and rates of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California certainly uh, has uh, a relationship with Eastern Municipal Water District, which is a direct party uh, to this proposal. So those are the two written comments that we know we have received. I'm going to ask Erica do we have any new emails uh, on this uh, public comment right now? Good morning. No, um, no, not as of right now. No more other, no other comments. Okay. And again, Tammy, if you can remind me that at the very end of the meeting of our agenda, at least, uh, we'll go back and check in with Erica to see if we received any uh, general public comments at that point. So again, public, if you're watching, if you want to provide some comments, uh, you still have an opportunity to do so uh, before we close uh, the meeting. Uh, so with that said, uh, we will jump into uh, business items. Uh, and the very first uh, item we have for you uh, is to kind of step back and set the stage a little bit uh, agnostically about the LAFCO process and the processes that we uh, utilize under state law and adopted policy in processing proposals, whether they be the proposals uh, that Fallbrook and Rainbow have provided to us, or if Jane or John Doe uh, out in El Cajon or uh, uh, Santee provide us. Um, as we will uh, talk in more detail going forward, uh, while LAFCO has certainly a lot of discretion in how we process or rather how we uh, evaluate and ultimately act on proposals, uh, we do follow a prescribed um, outline, if you will, under state law on how we ready proposals 
uh, under three distinct phases. Uh, and do if you go ahead and uh, start the PowerPoint, uh, the very first phase of a LAFCO review process uh, starts with the building blocks of uh, filing an action and then the things that LAFCO uh, staff goes through. And committee members, we will make this uh, uh, slide or this PowerPoint available uh, on our uh, website. So this is really just for the benefit of, of those who are visual learners like myself. Uh, but briefly, uh, members, uh, there are three ways that proposals can be initiated to uh, change boundaries in the state of California. Uh, a local governmental agency, a county, a city, a special district, and a school district all can adopt resolutions of applications uh, with LAFCO uh, spe specifying what type of boundary change uh, they are proposing. A single boundary change is just simply referred to as a change of organization. Uh, oftentimes though, if you move one boundary, you have to move others in California, and that's why the term reorganization uh, is frequently used and that's why, uh, with respect to the two proposals filed by Fallbrook and Rainbow, they're referred to as reorganizations. Uh, the other common route to initiate uh, boundary changes in California is a simple petition. Uh, so a landowner, a registered voter, uh, can come forward, and as long as they uh, can show that uh, they are representative of, of at least 25% of the affected territory, uh, well, that can start a process to move the boundary lines as well. Uh, and then third and finally, uh, LAFCO itself, the commission, uh, if they uh, so see fit, uh, can initiate changes of organization uh, in limited circumstances, committee members. Uh, specifically, uh, if the commission goes through the process of a municipal service review, uh, and at the end of that municipal service review concludes that some uh, uh, change in the footprint of a special district, whether it to be uh, to form a new special district, to dissolve an existing special district, or to do a combination, a consolidation or merger, if you will, uh, LAFCO, the commission itself, can uh, adopt its own resolution of application uh, as well. And so once one of those three avenues get initiated committee members uh, and the proposal is filed with LAFCO. There are these five baseline steps uh, that LAFCO staff goes through in processing a proposal before it ever really sees the sun, uh, sunlight uh, and at least uh, before it goes to the commission for any particular action. And we summarize those five steps up on the screen uh, and the first thing is, once we get a, a proposal, staff does a preliminary review of the item, uh, issues a status letter, and typically uh, clarifies that uh, whatever has been submitted is incomplete for the time being, and here are all the things that either we need to look at or here are all the things that still need to be submitted. Uh, typically, uh, this uh, is the time when we address any uh, issues relating to CEQA, uh, California Environmental Quality Act. Uh, LAFCO is subject to uh, 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 um, complying with the re uh, requirements of CEQA. And typically during step one, uh, we at least identify what the game plan is in following our CEQA requirements. Uh, and then that leads us to step two, where we take our initial comments that we've already provided the applicant in our status letter, and we create what we internally call is a preliminary staff report that goes out to all uh, subject and affected agencies. Subject agencies under LAFCO law are those agencies that are specifically going to be affected by whatever boundary change has been uh, submitted. So in the case of the Fallbrook proposal that we have on file, uh, Fallbrook, uh, San Diego County Water Authority, uh, and Eastern Municipal Water District are all subject agencies because their boundaries are in play. Conversely, there's also this noticing requirement to affected agencies. Affected agencies for this purpose are those agencies whose boundaries are not necessarily being proposed to being changed. However, their boundaries or their spheres of influence overlap 
the area that is subject to some uh, or proposed boundary change. And that does include college and school districts. Um, and so once we get that interagency review notice out, uh, the intent is to not only highlight that there is some proposed boundary change uh, in the works, but to get subject and affected agencies to start thinking about what uh, technical issues should LAFCO be aware of? And then separately, are there any specific terms and conditions uh, that uh, they want LAFCO to at least consider, uh, if not uh, recommend? And typically, that's a, a 20 to 30 day process uh, for your routine boundary changes. For more complex boundary changes, uh, we often and do extend uh, the interagency review uh, upwards to, you know, one to three months. And as Robert will talk a little bit about uh, uh, in the next item, for the Fallbrook and Rainbow proposals, we have extended the uh, interagency review out to a full uh, three months. Now, as we get the interagency review going, there's also a very important noticing requirement that LAFCO needs to pay attention to, and that is under state law, you just can't change a boundary uh, line or boundary lines without making sure that the property tax roll uh, is synced up. And so one of the things that LAFCO is tasked with doing is initiating and shepherding um, a series of actions involving county assessor, uh, auditor offices, as well as ultimately the Board of Supervisors uh, to uh, negotiate an exchange of property taxes. Now, that even means if there's not going to be any exchange in taxes, well, we still need to go through the process to make sure that if the number is zero, well, then we need to make sure that the number is zero. Um, in most cases, when we are talking about uh, either expanding or modifying existing boundary lines, LAFCO's role is simply a noticer. Uh, ultimately, the subject agencies and or the Board of Supervisors are uh, given autonomy to negotiate these agreements. We just simply make sure that the, clock, the, the, the watch clock is being observed. Um, however, if we are ever in the business of forming or dissolving uh, agencies, in particular forming agencies, uh, cities or special districts, well then LAFCO actually is the entity that uh, determines what if any property uh, tax uh, should be exchanged. So once we get the status letter out, the interagency review has been concluded, and we have a tax exchange uh, finalized. Uh, LAFCO staff goes through the process of uh, issuing the applicant a certificate of filing. That's the legal document, uh, committee members, that says from our perspective, from the executive officer's perspective, all the information we need to make informed uh, opinion uh, has been uh, uh, received, and we can go ahead and uh, identify and schedule an actual public hearing. Uh, under law, we need to issue a staff report within five days of that hearing uh, that includes recommendations uh, on the boundary change or the proposed boundary change itself, as well as, and this is certainly important committee members because I have a feeling this will be a, uh, a topic uh, for the committee going forward if LAFCO believes approval terms are warranted, uh, well, then that is included in the uh, executive officer report uh, as well. We have a note here on the side about the length of the administrative review. Typically, it's a three to five month window to get proposals uh, from their birth uh, uh, and all the way through the administrative review process to the commission. Uh, in more complex uh, um, uh, instances, and I would suggest the Fallbrook and Rainbow proposals are complex, it certainly expands beyond six months, and it's not uncommon uh, for proposals to take a year or two uh, to go forward. Uh, in particular, uh, and this doesn't necessarily apply to the Fallbrook Rainbow, but a lot of our bigger proposals involve uh, development projects, and so as we try to sync to whatever the development planning uh, entitlement process is, uh, that can extend out. Robert just completed 
a proposal called the San Marcos Highlands that seem to be on our uh, desk for uh, five or, or, or seven years uh, before it finally got to the commission uh, just a few months ago. So, do you can go ahead and go to uh, phase two. And so, once we get past the staff part, and this is when staff essentially says goodbye to the proposals, and it's in the hands of the commission, our uh, eight voting members and our five alternates, uh, the commission at the end of the day, has a whole lot of discretion in what it deems uh, to be um, uh, the merits of a green light uh, or a red light. Um, our most pertinent local policy, and this applies to the Fallbrook and Rainbow uh, proposals, is when the commission takes up actions, we have a policy, legislative policy 107, that says uh, we should do our best to mediate and or at least uh, sunlight any inner uh, jurisdictional disputes that come our way. Um, but at the end of the day, just like uh, any other board, you have these three fundamental opportunities or three fundamental uh, action uh, outcomes, approval, uh, often approval with uh, perhaps conditions, uh, a straight disapproval. Uh, if LAFCO disapproves of a proposal, under statute, uh, a similar proposal cannot come forward for at least one calendar year. Uh, and then if need be, uh, the commission can always continue an item uh, on the dais, and it can do so in 70-day increments, right? So if a commission heard a proposal today, chose to continue it, uh, we would at least have to do a check-in of some sort uh, in 70 days, and if the commission saw fit, they can continue it uh, for another 70 days. Now, importantly, under phase two, and before landowners or, or registered voters could get involved in protesting uh, anything, if LAFCO approves or even disapproves of a proposal, under state law, there's this 30-day window right afterwards where anyone from the public can come in and file for reconsideration. Uh, I have been doing LAFCO for almost 20 years, I think the Robert's same time, and uh, it is a rare instance when the reconsideration period is exercised. Uh, but nonetheless, there's this opportunity in which someone, including the commissioner, could say some fundamental piece of information was not discussed and or introduced in the commission uh, proceedings and has merit for uh, review. Uh, but again, it is an opportunity under state law for LAFCO to have a check in our uh, approval or even disapproval process. Now, the third and final step, and do you can go to my last uh, slide here. If the commission goes ahead and approves something, well, under baseline scenario, and I say baseline because as Robert will talk about, we're not necessarily going to talk, uh, uh, go through a baseline procedure with respect to Fallbrook and Rainbow, but nevertheless, for context, uh, unless we have 100% consent of landowners and registered voters, um, which is certainly not the case any time we do something big, uh, we have to hold a protest hearing. The protest hearing is the opportunity for landowner and registered voter to say uh, and file their uh, opposition to whatever uh, the commission has approved. And based on the uh, submittal uh, volume, three outcomes could be triggered uh, by a protest hearing. If less than 25% of registered voters or landowners take uh, umbrage with what LAFCO have done, we acknowledge it, but it's not enough to stop the proceedings. We go forward uh, with the approval and we just wait out whatever terms and conditions are outstanding. If, however, 25 to under 50% of landowners and or registered voters uh, protest, well, then that does trigger an actual election. And there's a whole process that goes into it afterwards, but uh, it means that the registered voters of the affected territory will ultimately have majorities, majority say in whatever LAFCO has approved. And then finally, if during the protest proceeding, uh, there's been more than 50% of written opposition received from either landowners or registered voters, well, then the proceedings are outright uh, terminated. Um, <clears throat> typically, uh, the first two outcomes are most likely. Either we don't get enough protest and the order uh, of the commission goes forward, or, and most recently in the case of 
our uh, interest in reorganizing the Julian Cuyamaca Fire Protection District. Uh, an election is triggered, uh, but not outright termination. So uh, finally, committee members, as you see on the screen, uh, at the end of the day, uh, if there is an election, it, one of two scenarios occurs by majority vote, either the uh, registered voters uh, confirm whatever the commission has approved and we go forward and issue a certificate of completion once all terms are done, or if uh, the majority of the residents say no to an action, uh, and this happened uh, with me in my uh, uh, days uh, in Marin uh, County, Alaska, uh, trying to uh, consolidate some uh, uh, wastewater agencies. If enough uh, persons protest again, uh, or not protest, but vote uh, against the action, well, then LAFCA simply issues a certificate of termination and we're done. So, and do you can take this down off the screen. The intent here is just simply to provide context committee members. Uh, most, but not all, of these processes are ultimately going to be followed in the processing and review of the Fallbrook and Rainbow proposals. Robert is going to give us a brief uh, update on those and can touch upon some of the distinctions uh, or deviations that we're going to be uh, addressing in, in those proposals. But I do just want to stop and check in with the committee members to see if there's any questions or, uh, I guess, comments. And I'll do so in, um, by calling out each member. And if you don't have a comment, you could just simply say no or I'm good and we can keep moving on. But if you do, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if others have the same question. So with that, I'm going to uh, just randomly go down my list here, starting uh, with Jack. Uh, I have no comments at this point, Keen. Thank you, sir. Uh, Tom. No comments as well. Thank you. Nick. Keen, I have no comments or questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Sandy. Uh, no comments or questions. Thank you. Kim. I actually do. Um, on the box, um, you had a sidebar that said environmental review. And I was hoping, I don't know if you can address it now or maybe Robert can address it when he talks about the distinctions. Um, it says that LAFCO does its own uh, seek review as a responsible agency, but it also said that you generally rely on uh, the CEQA uh, done by the, the agency if it's adequate. And so my question, maybe Robert can do this in his report, if you know, has uh, Fallbrook and Rainbow done uh, CEQA and has LAFCO looked at it yet to determine if it's adequate enough for you to rely on it um, as your responsible agency? Outstanding question, Kim. I'm sure it's a question uh, on others' minds, and I know it's a question on the Water Authority's mind. So yes, Fallbrook and Rainbow, as lead agency under CEQA, uh, uh, made a CEQA determination, uh, both of them independently, uh, that the proposed uh, reorganizations that they are submitting is exempt under LAFCO uh, 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 further CEQA review under what's referred to as Class 20. Uh, LAFCO, uh, as responsible agency in the course of preparing our preliminary staff report, has identified that and for the time being uh, uh, believes that that is an appropriate um, uh, CEQA finding. That said, and Robert will uh, perhaps touch upon this in the next agenda item, part of the administrative review is to solicit comments and to revisit all of the working assumptions. And I use that phrase on purpose, committee members. In order to start processing a proposal, there are assumptions that we make. One of them is that the CEQA determination made uh, by Fallbrook and separately Rainbow uh, is sufficient. Uh, we will certainly consider and reconsider that position going forward if need be, but for the purposes of the proposal review at this point, uh, that's kind of our uh, line of sight. And Holly and Robert, uh, maybe you could touch upon this when you get uh, do your uh, overview, uh, but Holly, did you want to add anything to uh, my attempts of a, a summary? No, you, you covered it. Okay. So... But a good question, Kim, and a, 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 an item that I know the committee probably will weigh in uh, further going forward. Uh, so very good. Uh, any other questions, Kim? 
Okay. Just one, one more. Um, I'm assuming you're doing separate CEQA on Fallbrook and Rainbow because they have separate jurisdictions or, or separate CEQA has been done. There'll be separate determinations. Correct. So Fallbrook and Rainbow have uh, uh, purposefully filed their own reorganization proposals. We are, for the uh, benefit of ease, processing them to date informally together but they are two separate actions, so there will be two separate CEQA uh, determinations made by LAFCO. Presumably at this point as a responsible agency, perhaps, perhaps, uh, we may convert, uh, revert into a lead agency role if need be. Okay, so, thank very you. Good. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Lydia, any questions? I have no questions or comments, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gary? Yeah, the only question I have is, as we go through this process, will we also take a look back at the 2014 uh, service review that was done by LAFCO and some of the things that were brought up uh, specifically during that period that may uh, be effective at this point as well? It will certainly serve uh, all information generated to date, and then the information Robert will uh, generate going forward is part of the process, so yes. Very good. Uh, David, any questions? Keen, thank you for the for the overview. Much appreciated. Um, yes, uh, my only question at this point is if there's anyone else on the on the call, not a member of the advisory committee or county staff, uh, who should introduce themselves. Uh, I know that uh, uh, LAFCO staff is identified uh, quite a bit. My screen is a bit compacted because I'm looking at a couple things. I don't see anyone else uh, outside of uh, LAFCO staff, um, but uh, uh, if uh, there is, perhaps uh, uh, we can go down a little bit. Uh, and if you open up the participant uh, email or the participant list, and I'll refer to Duke for help on this, you can identify any uh, names, and all the names I'm seeing are either committee members or the Army of LAFCO staff. Keen, I think you just muted yourself. Thank you, sir. Uh, and to the spirit of David's request, if anyone is on the call or on the Zoom that's not part of the committee or uh, LAFCO staff, um, if you'd be kind enough to email Erica, and then Erica, we can uh, get back to that registry uh, in a little bit. So thank you, David. So uh, going forward, uh, Brian, just back from Colorado, any questions? Thanks, Kane. No questions for me right now. Very good. And then Rachel, any questions? No, no questions. Thank you. Okay. Well, committee members, thank you for uh, going through that uh, overview process. So now we've gone 30,000 feet. We're going to go a little further down below uh, to the hard deck, and I'm going to ask our chief policy analyst, Robert Barry, who is the project manager for both of these proposals, uh, to give us an overview of where we are in the process, uh, and I'm sure Robert will entertain uh, some specific questions too. So Robert, I'm going to hand this off to you. Hi, good morning, committee members. Uh, thanks for taking the time this morning to talk about these proposals. Um, I appreciate the ad hoc committee. I think it's very valuable to have your input and your perspective as we're uh, processing these proposals. Um, as Keen mentioned, these are complex proposals, um, but what is proposed is a reorganization. And that reorganization consists of annexations and detachments of agencies exercising services uh, in an area that uh, uh, they are authorized to do so. Um, uh, uh, we have two proposals, both submitted by resolution of application, uh, one from Fallbrook PUD, one from Rainbow MWD. They both propose basically the same thing, which is a, uh, a detachment uh, from the County Water Authority, which is their overlying wholesale provider uh, for water services, and an annexation to Eastern Municipal Water District, which is uh, located in Riverside County, 
uh, and is also actively providing retail and uh, wholesale water services within its existing service area. So for LAFCO purposes, it's a very straightforward proposal. Um, there are no new activations of services. There are no uh, uh, divestitures of services. We are simply um, uh, uh, detaching from one existing wholesale water service provider and annexing to another wholesale water service provider. Uh, what we uh, are required to do is to perform conforming sphere of influence changes uh, to make sure that these jurisdictional changes are consistent with the existing spheres um, for the subject agencies. So the process is keen delineated is, is, is very straightforward and applies to all of our proposals. We receive the application. Uh, in most cases, we have quite a bit of pre-application consultation with the affected agencies and the applicant. Um, mainly to make sure that we are preparing them for an adequate submittal and also to make sure that we're identifying any uh, potential issues that LAFCA should be aware of or that they should be concerned with that are germane to our responsibilities once we receive it. So the local uh, approvals are really where the uh, start of most of our proposals come from, whether that action is from uh, the local uh, service providers, public agencies, or from the affected uh, registered voters or, or landowners. In this case, obviously, we're dealing with uh, the public agency resolutions. And so we receive this application uh, and we return status letters to both the agencies, acknowledging that we have received the applications uh, and that they are considered incomplete pending processing. Now, 99.9% uh, .9 of the applications we receive are incomplete uh, because there's a number of prerequisites that are required prior to LAFCO issuing a certificate of filing. Certificate of filing, as your executive officer mentioned, is the LAFCO official document that's, uh, uh, that certifies that the application that has been submitted is complete and can be scheduled for a, a commission hearing. Um, there is no statutory deadline for that processing. That processing starts at the point at which the application is submitted. We are required within 30 days to do a status letter on the submittal. Uh, the submittal can be in pieces uh, but primarily what we need are processing fees. If we don't have a resolution of application and processing fees, um, we really don't have an application to process. So as things come forward, they either are submitted complete in terms of all the materials required, um, or they come in uh, piecemeal with certain portions that we identified as needing to be supplemented. So again, once we receive the proposal, uh, we have the discretion to request additional information up to the point of the certificate of filing. Um, that can include CEQA information, that can include application information, service information, whatever it is that the executive officer deems is necessary to process this particular proposal. Every proposal is different. Every proposal is unique, um, uh, regardless of the similarity between the uh, actions that are proposed. Uh, they're all different agencies with different local circumstances and conditions. And all of our proposals are then filtered through our local policies and procedures. Uh, so these two proposals have received staff letters or status letters. Uh, we did generate a preliminary staff report that serves as notification to all interested ag agencies and affected agencies uh, that we've received the proposal with a request for comments. Um, as Ken mentioned, we've extended our typical uh, 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 review period of about 30 days to 90 days again, to reflect the complexities of these proposals and also uh, to make sure that we're accommodating all agencies and, and interested parties in terms of providing input. Uh, 90 days is what's been given to this proposal. That is pretty extraordinary because our typical review period is about 30 days. Again, that's a courtesy review period, not a statutory one. And we will take comments on the proposals up to and including the commission hearing following the certificate of filing. So again, we are a neutral party in this process. We are required by state law to take that role and to look at the procedures and the priorities that the legislature has uh, uh, empowered our commission with. So my role here is to help the applicant uh, uh, sufficiently navigate the LAFCO process and receive a certificate of filing so that the commission can hear their proposal. Um, my role has been that way in the 17 years that I've been here. Uh, I've handled everything from routine proposals to very complex proposals. This is a very similar proposal to a number of other uh, type of uh, multi-district reorganizations, some with uh, uh, mutual consent, some obviously with uh, no mutual consent. And so where we are at this point is 
We have processed the applications to the assessor's office and to the auditor. The assessor's office has confirmed the boundaries and the assessed valuations in the affected areas. The auditor has identified the subject property taxes that would be affected and has initiated notification to the affected agencies that a tax exchange negotiation period has uh, started. And that commenced on June 29th. The end of that property tax exchange negotiation period is August 31st. Under the Board of Supervisors policy in San Diego County, it's the uh, uh, responsibility of the Department of Planning and Development Services to shepherd that process once the auditor is completed with it with its report. So between June 29th and August 31st, the County Department of Planning and Development Services is going to be working with these agencies to discuss these negotiations. Now, uh, it sh this should be couched in a, a very important point. The County of San Diego has adopted a master property tax exchange agreement that is uh, governs um, proposals that include only include annexations and detachments from what's considered enterprise districts. And it's called the Master Enterprise District Resolution. Now that master agreement has been applied to um, almost all of LAFCO proposals affecting annexations and detachments of enterprise districts, which are commonly known as sewer and water districts uh, uh, in terms of receiving fees for their services, uh, as opposed to being dependent on property taxes. So what we need to do is to have the county, the Department of Planning and Land Use make a determination as to whether or not that master agreement applies to these proposals. If those apply, what they stipulate is, is that no property tax would be exchanged. Uh, uh, if they uh, do not apply, then the negotiations would uh, um, apply uh, re as required under the revenue and tax code. Now the auditor has already notified the agency, so those negotiation periods uh, have already started on both proposals. So it's important for these agencies in the county to work together to understand whether there's a request for the master enterprise district resolution to be applied to this, or if there is an opportunity for a negotiated property tax exchange. LAFCO is not a party to that process. We are simply uh, the agency that provides that information to those agencies so that the county can make its determination. Uh, it's also should be noted that the revenue and tax code identifies the county as the agency to negotiate on behalf of all affected special districts. So it's important for these agencies to get in touch with the county and um, have a very uh, uh, active participation in this process. Once that process is completed, um, that's one of the final requirements before LAFCO can issue a certificate of filing. But that's not the only requirement. We have a number of other issues that we're trying to work through to be able to bring this forward to a commission of consideration. Uh, the certificate of filing, however, statutorily is required to follow the county's determination on the property tax exchange. So all that being said, where we are at this point uh, is in the negotiation period for the property tax exchange. Once that's completed, then we would be uh, 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 somewhat prepared to issue a certificate of filing. However, there are extenuating circumstances and a number of questions on uh, 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 aspects of these proposals that we feel are compelling. Uh, and that is the whole point of this committee to be assembled on an ad hoc basis. So what I do want to mention is, is that our preliminary staff report went out um, prior to the time where uh, the districts took actions on their notices of exemptions. Now, um, I want to be very clear. My understanding of CEQA is, is that LAFCO is going to be a responsible agency for these two proposals. Uh, the, no other agency has adopted, or I'm sorry, uh, produced uh, or accepted and certified a negative declaration in NEIR. Therefore, LAFCO is in a position as a lead agency on our actions for our discretion. Um, and it is incumbent to us to determine um, uh, right up front whether or not a, uh, an exemption applies to this. Now, it's helpful that the districts have adopted notices of exemptions under Class 20. And I think that there are very compelling arguments, uh, both facially and factually, as to why Class 20 would apply to this proposal for LAFCO's use. Uh, we are not in a position to make that determination. And that determination will not be made until the certificate of filing has been issued. That corresponds to what's required as the lead agency under CEQA uh, per the guidelines. And so the, the, the issue to us is, is that, again, with a complex and compelling proposal like this, with a number of moving parts and both local and regional issues, uh, the CEQA review is very important. However, uh, it's very important for us to also realize that the class, the categorical exemptions are available to us specifically for these types of proposals where we are not activating any new services 
or changing any areas where those services were already provided. Now, the, the, the agencies providing those services are going to change, but we're not activating any new services uh, in an area geographically where those services are not already provided. So on a facial basis, we're only dealing with changes of organization of local public agencies in a geographic area where no new services are going to be provided that aren't previously exercised. So on a facial basis, class 20 does, does comply. Now on, a, a, on an extended basis, we understand that there's concerns in relation to the financial aspects of and implications of this, but it needs to be stated that the CEQA guidelines say that financial implications in themselves are not an impact or an effect unless they are a result of a physical change. So we're, we are open to listening to all of these parties in terms of determining whether there are direct or indirect physical changes that, that are going to come from these proposals. Uh, but we have yet to see anything substantial in the record uh, to confirm that. Uh, and I'm looking forward to reading the additional information that we receive through this process. Beyond that, Local Policy L107 uh, has not been satisfied. Now, the, the policy in itself is, is incumbent on the applicant, and I think that that's important to understand because the applicant has made efforts through the record that we've received in the in application to outreach to the affected agencies and has been rebuffed uh, uh, with the understanding that that discussion would occur once the applications have been submitted. Well, to be very frank, this is the time for those discussions to begin compliance with L107. Now, the ultimate result of that doesn't require resolution, but what it does require is a good faith effort to discuss these issues and come to some sort of uh, conclusion so that we have something to evaluate. None of those have occurred prior to the submittal of this application, and we are still looking forward to that. I think this ad hoc committee is somewhat uh, 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 needed because of the lack of the conformance with L107 between the discussions of the affected agencies. So L107 is basically just to identify our issues ahead of time so that we don't have to work these issues out in front of the commission so that the staff evaluation has the benefit of the consideration of both sides and that we have something to recommend to the commission. We really don't right now. And I'm looking forward to having the affected agencies discuss this a little bit further so that we can uh, uh, make a proper evaluation under our requirements as LAFCO staff. So from this point forward, what we're looking for uh, is to complete the property tax exchange to address the overarching CEQA issues and, and, and also to address uh, uh, whether we can find some sort of resolution um, that we can provide to the commission as an alternative determination of what the proposal is proposing. Um, so again, we're not expecting consensus, we're not expecting agreement, but we are expecting a, 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 a substantial amount of information to be provided from the affected agencies to give us the public record to evaluate this efficiently. What we have received is the applications and what we've received in complete information indicates that there is value to these proposals. Now we understand the opposition and the concerns. There are specific provisions in CKH uh, for special districts um, to oppose annexations under service related issues and financial issues. Many of those categories are somewhat applicable here in reverse on a detachment, but it needs to be substantiated that there will be physical changes to the environment for it to be an effect or an impact under CEQA. Uh, we are talking about um, two agencies that exist, services that are already being provided, no new services and no changes to geography in terms of where those services are presently exercised. So I, I, I'd like to hear something more besides uh, um, we are not talking to each other so that we can provide adequate recommendations to the commission moving forward. And with, with that said, I, I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, Robert, just uh, for the benefit of context, I know you had some maps, you and do were looking at maps. Can we just quickly uh, show that to the group so everyone has a visual understanding of the two boundaries uh, that are in question? Yes, my apologies. I meant to uh, use that as part of my illustration. So uh, the first map that you're seeing here is uh, basically a, you know, a regional map of Southern California. So in the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California's member agencies, the San Diego County Water Authority being the largest one. Um, the smaller circle above there is Eastern uh, Municipal Water District. And you can see its adjacency 
uh, in Riverside County to the San Diego County border. Um, but this is really just illustrative to show uh, on a, a, a much larger regional basis of where these uh, affected agencies are located. Can you go to the next slide? So this is a shot of the County Water Authority within the Western portion of San Diego County. Uh, it's a mix of agencies, special districts and cities, as well as Camp Pendleton with 24 agencies. The circled area indicates where Rainbow and Fallbrook uh, districts are located right along the Riverside border and also uh, adjacent to the two uh, CWA aqueducts that extend north through south through the city or through the county the, that you can see which are the blue lines extending into Riverside County. Uh, those lines extend uh, up into uh, Eastern Municipal Water District uh, and there are various uh, connections in San Diego County uh, for the Water Authority for Rainbow, uh, for Fallbrook, as well as uh, for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. To avoid saying that all the time, the LAFCO acronym that we've used has been MET. So if I say MET, I, I'm meaning the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. So um, could you go, do we have another slide, dude? Um, this is the uh, service area of Eastern Municipal Water District in Riverside County in relation to uh, the geographic territory where Fallbrook and Rainbow currently exist. As you can see, they're adjacent to each other, although they're in different counties. Uh, there is an, uh, an MOU between Riverside LAFCO and San Diego LAFCO that have addressed uh, the principal county questions. And I, I don't think that we have any issues with that remaining unless anyone has any questions uh, about that. But again, these maps were just to show kind of the adjacency between the two service areas and the regional uh, uh, makeup of, of where these agencies are located in Southern California. Um, uh, uh, this is a close up on Fallbrook and Rainbow in relation to their adjacency to Riverside and to uh, other agencies in the local area. Um, the dotted lines around those districts indicate their spheres of influence in their present locations. Um, as you can see, they're uh, uh, in far north San Diego County directly adjacent to each other uh, and bisected through uh, on one side by the, um, uh, the I-15 traveling between Riverside and San Diego County. Um, so I, I don't really have anything to add to those other than the illustrative uh, uh, purposes of those maps. Um, but again, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Outstanding, Rob. Um, thank you. What I, uh, I will go through the list of uh, everyone uh, uh, in reverse order, as I did before, uh, who has a, uh, and if you have a question, by all means, I'm going to defer to Robert, uh, unless you, uh, the questionnaire uh, or the question is directed to uh, someone else specifically. Um, if you don't have a question, uh, you can just simply say, uh, I'll pass or, or no question. Um, and then at the end of this, I appreciate uh, there may be follow-up that may be uh, uh, generated. Um, if for those who are familiar with Zoom, there's a uh, raise hand feature. At that point, uh, we can go uh, through that process for any follow-up comments after we get done with the initial roll. Um, and if that breaks down, I'll just look to do to uh, handle this and I'll be quiet. But nevertheless, I'm gonna start with uh, Rachel. Uh, any questions for Robert or others? I don't have questions at this moment, no. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Brian, any questions? I do have a question. I think it's probably um, best for maybe later in this process, but at some point along the line, I'm. what would be helpful uh, for me is information about um, what the relative percentage, I guess, of, of Fallbrook and Rainbow are um, with respect to that, that broader County Water Authority map that you had up was very helpful, um, both in terms of contribution to rates and revenue, um, and also assets and liabilities, if that's, if that's relevant. And again, that may, be, that may be for discussion later down the line. Outstanding, so uh, I'll add to what Brian just said, as more specific questions like Brian come up, uh, Robert and others can kind of create a, 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 a a living sheet, if you will, and we could start responding to those uh, and then uh, sending them out by way of email ahead of our next meeting. So thank you, Brian. Uh, let us check in with David. Any questions for Robert or others? 
No questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Gary. Yeah, I appreciate it. And, and Keen, I really appreciate you detailing out the process. And I think there's some, some concern in regards to some of the things that may have not occurred previously between the agencies. And I think part of it is clearing up the process. So I think you've, you've done a great job of that initially because uh, we were told by some of the participants previously that LAPCO had no, no role in this process. So I think that's been uh, cleared up previously, but uh, I just appreciate the fact that we're, we're starting from ground zero and moving forward. And I think it can be done in a positive way. Thank you, sir. Uh, Lydia. Uh, uh, just one comment, Robert, would you mind sending those uh, map slides in a PDF so I have some references to what, what as, this, as this process moves forward and what we're looking at? Thank you, Lydia. Uh, Kim. Sorry, had to unmute. You know I have two. Um, actually, the first one is a comment on um, Robert's first slide, if, if you could possibly pull that back up, where it designated the portions of the Met service area that were um, Colorado River Aqueduct versus State Water Project water. Um, I just, um, for clarity purpose, I just want to make sure that um, that represents the, the area of the County Water Authority. So Metropolitan's Colorado River Aqueduct. Okay, those are two separate aqueducts, but I, I wanna just be um, sure that it's understood that the Water Authority can receive both State Water Project water and Colorado River Aqueduct water in, in the blue area. So that's just a comment, um, even though um, different aqueducts, the capability for, for San Diego County to get both supplies is there. And then the second one, and Robert, I heard this very loud and clear um, message from you regarding CEQA and the, the financial implications that there, there actually has to be a direct or indirect um, physical impact. I think I heard that multiple times. And I guess at some point um, to hear my understanding, and, and this understanding is old, I mean, it's, it's probably from last year, was that for Fallbrook in particular, there were no um, physical uh, changes necessary, um, but for Rainbow, uh, there might be there might be the addition for a new um, pipeline, and if that w in order to uh, maintain service to their entire service area, and so that is a question, and I don't know if that can be um, addressed right now or or later um, during this process. I can respond to it if you like. I mean, at least preliminarily, again, we are in the process of evaluating before we're going to provide any recommendations. We're, we're simply trying to get this application to the point of a certificate of filing so that it can be scheduled for hearing. So part of that discussion is to address these issues and to determine from uh, not only the, the substantial evidence in the record, but also uh, the concerns of the interested and affected parties. And so through that process, we're receiving communication from uh, the applicant as well as the Water Authority, other affected agencies and the public with their concerns. All of that is gonna be evaluated and, and I think will be part of the recommendations this committee makes uh, on an advisory basis to staff and to the commission. So we haven't made that decision yet, but the understanding that I have is, is that um, both Rainbow and Fallbrook have longstanding existing capital improvement programs Many of these uh, 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 needed improvements or infrastructure changes would be simply implemented through their existing CIP or have already been identified or planned for those purposes. All of those actions would be subject to their own environmental review, their own public hearings for board approval before execution. And from my understanding would all be executed within the existing service area of Rainbow or Fallbrook. So LAFCO is not involved in those processes what the districts do within their own infrastructure maintenance services is part of their authorized services that they currently exercise. And LAFCO is not needed for approval of those types of actions. If they are direct impacts through those actions, they will be subject to their own environmental review following the board approval for those actions to occur. So again, I don't see a conflict. The, the services are already being provided. The aqueducts already exist and the supplies have already been vetted through the urban water management plans for all the affected agencies from 2015. So water supply isn't really an issue. Direct impacts doesn't seem to be an issue from what I've seen in the record. And uh, beyond that, the fiscal impacts are really part of LAFCO's 
uh, a conditioning authority for its approval in terms of payments for detachments, et cetera. Um, it's not a CEQA issue. The, the districts really need to work out these details in terms of the financial engagement that they've had as a member in a parent district as part of the process of uh, disengagement, not the CEQA review. Now, some may argue with that, but again, it's a direct physical impact that, that has to occur by virtue of these reorganizations. And that's not been substantiated. Okay, and so just, I wanna make sure I understand what you said, that if, if indeed Rainbow has a, a CIP project for a new pipeline to deliver water throughout its service area as a result of the de-annexation, if they have that in their uh, CIP, it's planned, it's budgeted, and they're going to handle CEQA separately, that does not rise to the level of triggering uh, physical changes to the environment that you feel LAFCO needs to look at in its process? Is, is that a fair assessment of what you just said? I, I think that, uh, that that's a fair assessment, but, but, but I think it has to be couched in the understanding that no determination has been made yet. And it's okay. not gonna be made until we get to the certificate of filing. And the certificate of filing is not gonna occur until we get to the tax exchange process and pass the L107 discussions. Okay. So again, okay. We, we have a lot of opportunities to talk about the details of this and to what degree it applies or not. And again, your committee here is going to provide us uh, uh, recommendations on that, I would assume. So okay. again, what we're saying is, is that the record that we have received so far are the application proposals and the evidence in there is substantial and it's compelling. And I think a fair argument can be made that class 20 applies and any peripheral impacts are already simply either planned uh, or would be executed through their own public hearing process and be subject to their own CEQA review within their authorized service area. Uh, that doesn't require LAPCO action. Thank you for the clarity, I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you, Kim. And then uh, just a little injection. Uh, uh, if, and I know we're gonna talk about CEQA, whether it's towards the end of this uh, or certainly in future meetings, I am going to defer to Holly to, to weigh in because it is an important issue for us. Uh, so that said, uh, Sandy, any uh, questions for Robert so far? Um, uh, kind of a statement and um, a specific um, ask to you, Keen. Um, as I had understood this meeting today, what had been agreed to that this would be procedural and that the substantive review would await all of the filings in September, um, which is September 18th. The Water Authority has not filed. So far, the only material that the commission has is incomplete. And, um, you know, there's quite a bit more information to be forthcoming. Um, to that point, I would uh, let you know that we have not received the property tax exemption that was talked about earlier. Um, so um, we are not part of that um, loop. And I would respectfully for the record um, say to you that Robert's description of CEQA is incomplete. Um, we have submitted a letter um, to that effect and I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to discuss it, but I wanted to make sure that the committee members are aware of that and understand that we do not agree with um, Robert's description. Um, I'm sorry to have to get to this point today. Again, I thought this was to be procedural and that we were going to await the filings until this substantial conversation occurred. So um, with that, I think it's important that the committee members are um, emailed that letter directly on CEQA um, since we've delved into this conversation thus far. So those are my comments, Keith. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, very good. Uh, Nick, what say you? No questions at this point, King. Thank you, sir. Uh, Tom, any questions? Uh, no questions. I thought I would clarify for some of Kim's questions there with regard to CEQA. Uh, Rainbow does have a couple of pipelines that were all anticipated to be constructed prior to our application. Um, we are doing individual CEQA. One of them, we did an addendum to an EIR for a, a major development in our area that covered the CEQA on that pipeline. All the rest are mainly under a mile, which is categorically exempt, or a one acre or less was also exempt. So we'll be going through the process on those as those projects are, are let. Thank you, Tom. Jack. Uh, thank you, Keen, and, and thanks to all the LAFCO staff for, for working through this effort. 
And all the committee members, I know some drew the short straw at their agency. So I appreciate you taking your uh, Monday morning to work with us on this. A um, couple of just quick clarifications to follow up to Kim. So, so yes, from a Fallbrook perspective, there is absolutely no physical changes necessary. So just to be clear, you know, we're, we're currently just taking our water through the Met connections. Um, we've been doing that probably for the last six months or so. Uh, we have no need to use the water authority connections nor construct anything, right? So we can provide all our service off the Met connection. Uh, I think also to help the committee as you do the maps, one of the important things maybe uh, to show if possible is the delineation between uh, the Met and water authority owned uh, infrastructure because that, that plays in um, very clearly to why uh, what we're talking about may apply to Fallbrook and Rainbow, but not uh, any other water authority members. So uh, maybe as we do the maps, if we could just show that uh, ownership delineation between Met and the Water Authority, that might be helpful for the committee. And that was all I had to say. Uh, very good, Jack. Thank you so much. So um, without uh, losing control, if there are any follow-up uh, comments uh, or requests for clarifications, go ahead and use your um, raise hand feature on uh, uh, Zoom. Uh, and I just want to respond to one thing that Sandy had mentioned. This is uh, her comment was absolutely correct. I have built this agenda as a kind of a uh, set the stage uh, item with no substantive uh, discussions from LAFCO staff. Now that said, uh, substantive comments or questions are certainly always welcome. Uh, as Robert uh, correctly noted, and I had asked him to do. Uh, was to give uh, the committee an overview of where we are in the process. Um, and that includes, uh, in particular, um, our initial thoughts on what has been submitted to date. But as Robert has uh, identified and discussed a couple of times, this is evolving. We're at the very early stage. Uh, and more uh, 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 an additional substantive dialogue from all of you is expected and LAFCO is going to start in future meetings offering up some of its substantive feedback on what's in the record. So uh, this is about setting the stage, but that said, uh, it's a substantive stage, I guess. So some, there's going to be some overlap. So uh, I see one hand up on the screen. Uh, Gary, uh, additional question from you or comment? No, I think, uh, and I appreciate uh, Jack Beebe's uh, requesting that the pipelines be shown because I do think that's important to be able for everybody to be able to see that. But uh, could we also include on the Riverside side of things the boundaries for Western and Eastern and where those uh, physically sit as well? Absolutely. If I could just interject for a moment, um, uh, our GIS information is somewhat limited to San Diego County. We are in the process of acquiring GIS information for the agencies in Riverside County. So this initial meeting is kind of an ad hoc map uh, and we will be able to have more detailed information moving forward. Thank you, Robert. So uh, seeing no other hands raised, I think we're good to move on uh, to the next uh, item 4C and I'll be very quick on this one. It's not gonna be 10 minutes. So what is LAFCO's expectations for the advisory committee. Well, by way of the commission's direction at our last meeting, uh, our sole expectation is that you are to help uh, inform LAFCO staff in going through this review process and ultimately up into the point of uh, deciding uh, when we have enough information and when we can pivot and go on to the commission uh, for their consideration. So the life uh, uh, line of the, the committee will last up and until we issue a certificate of completion. Uh, and as Robert and I have mentioned, that's when we have it tested out loud to everyone. We think we have enough information for the commission to make an informed uh, determination on not just the boundary changes that are proposed, uh, but if there are appropriate terms uh, and conditions. Um, now, uh, in terms of a little more specifics for the advisory committee and our expectations therein, uh, we expect over the next few meetings that you will weigh in on uh, not just the baseline factors that LAFCO has to look at anytime 
we look at uh, making changes to boundary changes, and those are codified under a section of LAFCA law that all of you, I think, will uh, be given a, a copy of soon, uh, Section 56668 of California Government Code. And there's 15 entries, but within each entry, there's multiple things that LAFCO has to look at, uh, but also uh, issues of local importance. And we are hearing loud and clear, to be very clear on our end, that uh, we are going to address uh, water reliability. We are going to address uh, impacts, uh, financial impacts uh, on the member agencies uh, within the San Diego County Water Authority should Fallbrook and Rainbow leave, as well as the impacts on Fallbrook's ratepayers should they leave and Rainbow's ratepayers should they leave. We will address those and we will look to the committee to help us uh, address those. Uh, there are going to be no formal votes of the committee. That said, I am sure as Robert and I go through this process, we will have straw votes looking for where is the consensus and where is it not. Uh, but to be uh, precise on this, um, there will be no formal recommendation from the committee that we take to uh, the commission. Uh, your input is for uh, LAFCO staff and ultimately will help inform our recommendation that will go uh, to the commission. So that's our expectation. Um, I'm so, uh, 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 yes, Robert, you, I was going to make a, 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 a declaration, but go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to clarify, the certificate of filing is the one that indicates that the application is complete and ready to be scheduled. The certificate of completion is the certificate that's issued uh, following the commission's approval and following the reconsideration period and following recordation. The, the certificate of, of completion is the document that's recorded that makes the commission's approvals effective. Uh, the certificate of filing is the one that indicates the application is complete and ready for hearing. Yes, and, and thank you, Robert. I probably spoke uh, on that. So I'm so confident that you all agree to that declaration of your role in helping LAFCO staff make an informed decision and decisions on everything that comes before it on this uh, item. I, I just know there won't be any questions and that will allow us to jump right into 4D. Uh, and that is, you know, let's hear the expectations from the four subject agencies as, as we are right now, right? And the four subject agencies are uh, Jack Beebe at Fallbrook, Tom Kennedy at Rainbow, uh, Nick uh, Kentis uh, with Eastern, and Sandy Curl with San Diego County Water Authority. Um, this is your opportunity uh, to, in, in a safe environment, yes, we're live streaming on YouTube, but nevertheless, in a safe environment, to tell uh, the committee what you want to get out of this uh, group uh, and uh, there will be no judgments, there will be no back and forth, but wh what are you looking to get out of this committee and your goals? So I'm going to go in order of our two uh, applicant uh, initiators, starting with Jack. All right, I can take, take the, the first cut here. So what, what, I, what I wanted to do today was just give some background on, on sort of the Fallbrook perspective, and I'm, I'm going to be... Um, brief and you know I'm here as a general manager but I've got an elected board right so the action for the application was taken by our board of directors you know that board of directors is elected uh, by the Fallbrook ratepayers so that's who um, you know they're the voice for is is our ratepayers um, and and water costs is a big deal here in Fallbrook so if um, people were around at our, our last rate hearing uh, we had people out the door we had to rent speakers um, to, to do it. So uh, the, the water costs over time has been a big issue here at Fallbrook. And that's what our board members hear about when they go to the grocery store, they live in this community. Um, as we talked about earlier, you know, we're in a, a unique situation from where our location is. The fact that although we're a member of the Water Authority, we don't use their infrastructure. Um, we have been a member for 75 years. Uh, and for that 75 years, we have been helping pay for the infrastructure in San Diego County. But sort of our board's opinion is just because we have been doing that for seven decades doesn't mean we should be obligated to do that forever. Um, water supply will come up uh, multiple times. We've completed multiple evaluations on that in our application. It was an evaluation Eastern did. 
Um, that's our role, right? We, we provide water to the community of Fallbrook. So it's very important to us. It's very important to our board. Um, that, that study clearly shows that Eastern could meet our water demands. So we're getting our water um, through Metropolitan right now, uh, through the Water Authority, and that study shows that uh, under all projected scenarios, they have sufficient water to meet our demands. No one's provided any substantive comments disputing that analysis to date. So um, that's, you know, that's what our board has relied on when they made the decision. Uh, we did talk, there's separate applications. So Fallbrook and Rainbow are unique. Fallbrook is, is underway on building a water supply project. We've been chasing with uh, Camp Pendleton for about six decades. Uh, Santa Margarita Conjunctive Use Project. Right now we're projecting that to supply about half our demand. So even that wasn't included in the water supply analysis, we've made our own uh, local supply um, investments that'll be coming online uh, in about a year and a half. Um, and, and again, there'll be a talk about, well, this, this is, you know, hasn't been done before, uh, which is correct. No one has left um, the water authority, no members have left the water authority. But fortunately, when we all formed the water authority, it was envisioned that someone may leave. And so there is a water authority act uh, that clearly says, hey, if you want to leave, here's what you do. So that's, you know, kind of uh, our position, our board's position has always been, all right, well, we agreed when we joined the water authority to these provisions if we wanted to leave. And so let's follow that um, provision. The other thing is we'll talk um, financial impacts um, the, the thing to note is, you know, the Water Authority primarily collects its revenue through water sales. So as a member agency decreases its demands on the Water Authority, that has an offsetting effect on other entities. Well, there's very large water supply projects that are about to come online. The city of San Diego has got a very large uh, pure water project many people are familiar with. That financial impact is greater to us than us leaving is to the water authority. So there is no, and there's no mechanism to say, all right, city of San Diego, you shall make, um, you know, Fallbrook ratepayers whole. So there is no mechanism within the current water authority that says, hey, when someone does something that decreases their demands or decreases their, their revenues to the water authority, they have some responsibility to offset that to everyone else. So that's kind of where, where we are as, um, you know, as a district and, and why our board uh, determined this was important moving forward, and that's that's it for me. Thank you, thank you, Jack. Uh, Tom, thanks, Keen, and I also want to thank uh, Lydia, Rachel, and Brian for for uh, participating with us. And just for your own information, uh, a little background on Rainbow: we weren't one of the original members of the Water Authority. Uh, we joined about ten years later after Fallbrook had, but at the time we went to join, we follow the County Water Authority Act, as Jack said, and within the County Water Authority Act, there are provisions for both what you pay to get in and how to how to get out. Uh, interestingly enough, when we first went to join the Santa County Water Authority, there was a, a bit of controversy about how much we would have to pay. So Rainbow actually filed another application to join Met directly. And there was quite a bit of discussion over many months back in 1953, in which the uh, it was trying to figure out whether Rainbow should be part of Met directly or be part of the Water Authority. Ultimately, became part of the Water Authority and for many, many years didn't make that much difference. Water was cheap, but Rainbow, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, as you drive up to Mecula, it's very rural. We still 65% of our water is all agriculture. That's our only uh, economic activity up there. We don't have a Starbucks. We don't have a, a chain grocery store. I think we have 12 signalized intersections at 80 square miles. Agriculture is, is the lifeblood of our local economy and water costs are a big part of that. And so uh, we have the ability to take our direct our water directly off our MET connections and supply the water to our customers in a much more efficient way than uh, purchasing from the Water Authority. And so I look forward to working with this committee to talk about what the relative impacts are, what the County Water Authority Act says, and then uh, you know give some good advice to the LAPCO staff so they can process the applications. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Nick, Eastern. Okay, um, Eastern's expectations for this advisory committee. I guess to answer that question, I'd just like to take a moment to explain how Eastern got involved in this process in the first place. Uh, it was about a year and a half ago, uh, Fallbrook and Rainbow approached Eastern with a request to consider being their provider of wholesale imported water for what they believe would be at a significantly less cost than that which they currently receive from the San Diego County Water Authority. 
uh, we at Eastern, we agreed to consider the request and the Eastern uh, Board approved a memorandum of understanding that allowed for the assessment and analysis of uh, Eastern's ability to reliably serve Fallbrook and Rainbow with no impacts to its other customers. Uh, since then, we've conducted a uh, thorough analysis of Eastern's water supply and system reliability to do just that. And we've determined that under all probable water supply and demand conditions, Easton can 100% reliably serve Fallbrook and Rainbow with no risk to any of its other customers now and into the, the future. Um, a technical memorandum detailing uh, Easton's water supply analysis and its conclusions is available and has been included as a part of Fallbrook and Rainbow's applications to LAFCO. Um, with, with that brief background, I'd like to stress that Eastern has no skin in this game and is not vested in any particular outcome associated with the process. However, if we can support Fallbrook and Rainbow to provide safe, reliable water service to their customers at the lowest possible cost, we're happy to do that. Um, so with that, I guess I'd say that uh, Eastern's expectations out of this process is that uh, San Diego LAFCO and this committee uh, gain a full understanding and appreciation of who and what Eastern is and our ability to support Fallbrook and Rainbow by providing them with essentially the same wholesale water supply that they currently receive from the Metropolitan Water District with a reliability of no less than 100% in order to meet their customers' needs now and into the future at the lowest possible cost. That's pretty much our expectation. Thank you, Nick. And then uh, last but not least, uh, Sandy Curl with the Water Authority. Expectations, Sandy. Sandy muted. Duke, can you uh, see if uh, Sandy? Go. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you, Keen. Um, Want to say thank you to you, the LAFCO staff, um, uh, our partners who are joining us from the county. Um, and Sandag and Lydia, I know she has much to do, so appreciate the amount of time that um, this probably is going to take. Um, I would say first and foremost, my expectation is that this committee and LAFCO will not make any um, prejudgments on anything based upon the two applications that have been received so far. There is quite a bit of information to be um, unearthed. For example, um, no mention was made of the fact that there is a court order that LAFCO cannot rely on the exemptions asserted by Rainbow and Fallbrook. Um, I would say that this is unprecedented. Um, this is complicated. This is about a regional agency planning for long-term supply reliability as we're required to do by the state of California. Um, it has to do with a region that has created that supply reliability on behalf of all of its member agencies. And a move away from that has many implications, not only here, but um, statewide in how water is managed and where resources come from, whether they come from the Bay Delta, they come locally, or they come from the Colorado River. Um, many, many issues to sort through. Um, we look forward with the opportunity to share that information and to have a robust and full-throated discussion. And yes, cost is very important and is very important to the Water Authority. And by having the reliability that we have, yes, the water is a little bit more expensive. Um, however, um, as other areas of the state um, invest in that supply reliability, they're going to see some more cost. And we certainly want, wouldn't want a situation like we had with the electri electricity industry when it uh, was in crisis and people were going out and looking for spot pricing. And we all know how that ended up. So this is very comprehensive. This is unprecedented in the state of California. It is in direct opposition to the governor's uh, water portfolio approach to water management. And so we look forward to getting into all of those issues and sharing that with you. I do feel that it is somewhat challenging in that this is not a typical detachment application that LAFCO would normally consider. So it's going to be taxing on everybody, but we're here to work with you um, to provide assistance and go through the information. Yes, it is correct that the Water Authorities Act when it was established in 1944 did um, provide for agencies leaving. 
I would say that there's been a long time since 1944 and what has transpired in terms of water law in the state of California that were not originally contemplated at that time. And so many of those things are gonna to have to be considered in that um, process as we go through it. Um, ultimately, um, I hope that this to be a fair and transparent process and look forward to be engaging with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. So I appreciate all four of you uh, Jack, Tom, Sandy, and Nick, uh, providing uh, your uh, thoughts, your agency's thoughts on what, and I will certainly double down on what Sandy just said, is going to be uh, a complex uh, set of uh, proposals to review. And uh, the benefit to LAFCO staff here is we're going to tap into all of your expertise and perspectives to hopefully address uh, as many issues to the point of consensus, and when consensus cannot be reached, uh, the point of uh, feeling that we're fully informed and then LAFCO uh, will simply uh, do what LAFCO does, and that is to make an independent determination on our end and bring it forward to the commission. So um, before we hit the last agenda item, which is to set our agenda for the last meeting, or for the next meeting, excuse me, I'm going to check in with Erica and her cat and to see if there are any uh, email uh, uh, comments that we received uh, since we checked in on public comment. So as of right now, no other public comment. Okay. So uh, for those who are watching, and I'm watching us live stream right now, we're about a five-second delay on YouTube. If uh, anyone is out there uh, listening and wants to provide comments, uh, do so uh, right now or uh, simply after the meeting, and we will post it all on a web uh, page uh, on our site uh, dedicated to the topic. So as for the very last item, uh, 4E, and that's agenda setting for the next uh, advisory committee meeting, I certainly want to get your uh, respective takes on topics you would like to see I have a suggestion, uh, and that is uh, we come back to the committee uh, with staff suggestions on uh, consultant uh, uh, inquiries, uh, more specifically the t topics we believe we want an outside expert to come in and help LAFCO evaluate, and not only to discuss those specific consultant topics with the committee, uh, but assuming you are agreeable to start getting uh, your feedback on some key assumptions that are going to inform what we ask the consultants to ultimately do. Uh, in my mind, there are three uh, related but distinct enough topics that merit one or more consultants right now, and that is a consultant to weigh in on the issue of water reliability, uh, specifically the difference between the supplies of Eastern uh, and the supplies of the Water Authority. So that's topic number one. Topic number two uh, is the financial uh, issue of rates, the rates uh, uh, impacts uh, with respect to the other 22 members of the Water Authority should Fallbrook and Rainbow uh, leave, as well as the rate impacts to Fallbrook and Rainbow should uh, one or both of them leave the water authority. And then the third topic, uh, and I think this is going to come up in different iterations every time we meet, is the idea of uh, an exit fee. Uh, specifically, uh, is there uh, a number that LAFCA believes is appropriate? Maybe it's zero, maybe it's one, maybe it's a lot more than one uh, with respect to uh, addressing any financial impacts uh, to the Water Authority and the other 222 member agencies should Fallbrook and or Rainbow leave. So it is certainly possible, although not probable, that we could find uh, one consultant to tackle all three of these. I'm guessing we'll need at least two, if not three, consultants just for these topics. But again, I'm not uh, discounting the possibility that uh, there may be one encompassing firm or consultant who can look at these. But the topic of reliability rate impacts, and a potential exit fee are the th three topics I would like to bring back to the committee at a meeting 
uh, within the next three to five weeks, depending on everyone's schedule. Um, so my comment, and I will go in roll call uh, order to uh, the committee is, are you agreeable to at least staff bringing these options and potential consultant alternatives to you? I'm not presupposing you are all going to agree that these three topics should be uh, go forward, but at least bring them for discussion. And then separately, are there other topics that you would like to see us bring back on an agenda for the next meeting? So uh, going in reverse order, uh, I'm going to go to Rachel first. Are you, uh, and the question is, are the topics I identified uh, for the next meeting agreeable and or are there any additions that you have right now? Rachel. Um, those would be agreeable to me. I guess the next meeting would just be discussing if those topics, it wouldn't be, we wouldn't have any information on those topics yet. It would just be deciding if those were sufficient. Yes, topics. well, well uh, what staff, and we've already done some work on this, we will bring you names uh, for all three of these topics uh, for you to also uh, look at and consider. Uh, certainly one of the things that we want to make sure is that uh, the consultant that LAFCO ultimately chooses, uh, there's consensus or at least not disagreement with any of the subject uh, agencies in, in using. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in agreement on those topics and I don't have any additional. I guess I would just want to make sure that um, after this meeting, we get an email with all the materials and anything else that we should be um, reading before that next meeting would be my only request. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Very good. Brian, uh, topics we've identified and any additions on your end. Thank you, Keen. Um, I'm in uh, agreement with the topics that you identified. Um, you know, one, one thought I'll offer about um, additional topics um, at some point in time in the future um, relates to uh, one of the things that Sandy mentioned about a lot having transpired since 1944 that may impact the act. Um, the act itself is easy enough to review. I'm personally not aware of um, any legal or court actions that have been taken since then that might impact what's what's actually in it. And so if there's a source um, that I can get information about that from, I, I think it, it might be relevant and helpful um, for my own education. Thank you, Brian. So one of the things that the Brian's suggestion uh, highlights is uh, lack of staff, perhaps just having uh, a, a, an informational uh, component to the next agenda where we don't necessarily address uh, and cover them, but for example, a copy of the uh, Water Authority Act and, and provide that to all of the members. Uh, so that's a good suggestion. Thank you, Brian. Uh, let us go now to uh, David. Uh, thoughts on the proposed topics uh, and then any additions? Dean, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, like, I like the three topics that are proposed and I would like to spend a little more time noodling on uh, other other topics and issues uh, that uh, I might be interested in. Thank you. Uh, noodling will be allowed, uh, and with the idea that uh, the 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 sooner the feedback, uh, the better we can go through and, and put it on the agenda. Uh, so thank you, David. Let us go now to uh, Gary. Gary, thoughts on the topics proposed, and then any additional items you might want to see on the next agenda. Yeah, I agree on the uh, topics proposed that you've provided, but uh, as far as an additional topic that uh, I would like to see uh, discussed, and it might be what goes to a uh, consultant as well, is not just the rates, but also the uh, other impacts that would change from moving from CWA to Eastern. Uh, and I can provide the letter. Eastern had requested a, uh, input from MWD uh, back about a year ago that listed things such as voting rights, such as preferential water rights, uh, a list of things that they asked MWD to weigh in on on how those would change and, and how that would impact everybody. So I, I can forward that unless Eastern already has it to been forwarded, uh, but I think that will that should be included, not just rates, but all, all impacts that we would see here specific to San Diego County ratepayers as a whole. Okay, Gary, so uh, as part of the informational uh, 
submittal, along with Brian's suggestion of the Water Authority Act, a copy of that letter that uh, provides a baseline discussion of other impacts. Did I summarize it well? Absolutely. And I'll, I'll ship you directly uh, a copy of the letter. And it uh, I don't have the reply from MWD as far as what their, their evaluation of that was. So uh, it might be something that we'll need to reach out and get as well. But I'll ship that to you today. Thank you, Gary. Very good. Uh, let us go to Lydia. I, I would like to have the discussion with the topics that you had suggested, and, and I think the other speakers have taken some of the thunder that I was going to ask for, so um, and I look forward to the next meeting. Thank you, Lydia. And yes, I was off on suggesting this would be only 50 minutes. I apologize. Uh, Kim, what say you? Um, full agreement with the topics that you recommended. And I also wanted to say thank you for that link where you chronologically listed everything that's been supplied to date. And if you could keep that going, that would be very um, appreciated with anything else that you add. Thank you, Kim. And thank you, Du, for uh, creating that link. And again, on our website, committee members, uh, Du has created a dedicated page to the Fallbrook and Rainbow uh, items, and I believe it's under the resource uh, do the under the resource banner. Uh, yes, it's also under our agenda page two. Perfect. So, perfect. Thank you, Do. Uh, Sandy, uh, thoughts on the three topics and any additional agenda items? Um, I like the three topics. A couple other thoughts is a uh, consultant with regard to environmental. Um, and I think we need to discuss the process for the consultant selection specifically. Uh, you've alluded to it a little bit, but I think we need to be clear on that. I also think that it's important that the LAFCO Act be provided um, in addition to the Water Authority Act because those two documents together will govern um, this process and ultimately I'm sure what goes to uh, the LAFCO Commission. And then um, I think, uh, Obviously, um, again, I wanna make sure that the committee has been provided a copy of our letter on CEQA. I know it's on the um, page that has been set up, but I wanna make sure folks have that. And at some point, um, legal issues are gonna to need to be addressed. I'm not sure that's a consultant, but I think that is a topic of discussion. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, Nick. Uh, topics uh, that we've identified in any additions? Uh, I, I have no issues with the topics that have been identified. I'm, I'm good with those. Um, I, I'll just add uh, with regards to the two topics that have been discussed, water reliability. Um, obviously, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that was a ver that's a very important topic to Easton. We want to make sure that we have the uh, water supply to um, reliably serve Fulbrook and Rainbow and all our other customers. And again, I I make note of the fact that um, uh, we, we put a lot of time and effort in and prepared a technical memorandum that spells that out. So I would encourage you to share that with all other committee members as we bring a consultant on board. And then with regards to the issue that I think Gary brought up uh, regarding MWD issues, uh, yes, uh, as a part of uh, Easton's due diligence, um, once we entered into an MOU, we wanted to reach out to Metropolitan Water District to make sure we had a full and clear understanding of any other issues uh, that 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 may be warranted uh, through this this process. And so we sent a letter to them uh, uh, identifying what we thought might potentially be issues, and they did respond. And uh, Keen, I can provide you with copies of both those those letters as we go forward. That would be uh, great, uh, Nick. Thank you, sir. And then uh, let us go to Tom. Tom, uh, topics uh, that we've discussed and or any additions? I don't have anything further to add and just want to thank everybody for their time today. Surprisingly brief. Thank you, Tom. And then let's go to Jack. Yeah, so again, I, I want to thank you and, and the staff. Um, the, the one thing from, I, I'm okay with the, the topics, Keen. I'd say the one thing we're uh, very cost conscious here in, in Fallbrook, not that we don't want to make sure uh, we fully vet everything, but it, it is, you know, everything we bring on to study is something that ultimately uh, Fallbrook and Rainbow pay for. Uh, we have done uh, several water supply analysis, so I'm, I'm hopeful, and, and Eastern did uh, one, that those can kind of be the basis so we don't, you know, reinvent the wheel uh, on some of these, and, and also on the financial side. I know both 
uh, Fallbrook and the Water Authority have already um, put some numbers together. So hopefully, you know, those consultants can be kind of focused on on reviewing what's out there, you know, taking comments from the parties and, and making assessments um, versus, you know, starting over at the beginning. So that's that's my only comment on those efforts. Uh, well, outstanding. So uh, in taking quick notes, uh, I've got uh, three formal agenda topics for the next meeting. Uh, and in no particular order, one is for LAFCA staff to bring back uh, consultant uh, suggestions and, and uh, underlining assumption uh, issues for the committee to weigh in on with respect to water reliability, water rate impacts, and potential uh, exit fees, as well as uh, Sandy's suggestion of uh, CEQA. Now that last one uh, will also touch upon uh, the second agenda item that came to mind as I was listening to everyone. And I think it would be helpful if we uh, have Holly provide uh, a summary on her end with respect to LAFCO's legal obligations and discretion under two distinct items. One is CEQA and the other, and perhaps the, the headliner in my mind, uh, the ability to uh, term and or condition approvals. I think that baseline would be helpful, Holly, if you're uh, up to it, and maybe have that uh, as the first item because I think that might inform the, the committee's discussion about consultants and the work of the consultants going forward. And then certainly as a third agenda item, uh, we'll check back in with Robert on the, on the status of, of the proposals. And then separately, just for information, we will provide everyone uh, copies of the Cortese not Hertzberg Act, that's the LAFCA statutes, a copy of the Water Authority Act, uh, and then working with both uh, Gary and Nick, identify these uh, MWD issues or other issues uh, as they may be. Um, so uh, with that, um, in using your, uh, maybe your uh, raise hand feature, if anyone has any last comments or, or questions or thoughts before we adjourn this meeting, and when I say adjourn, my working hope is that we could find a time uh, to meet on August 3rd, a uh, Monday, August 3rd, sometime in mid morning to late, uh, early afternoon. But I appreciate we're gonna have to have Tammy work on everyone's schedules to see if that's possible. But ideally, in my mind, um, that would be great, August uh, 3rd, uh, sometime in late morning or early afternoon, but we'll send out a, 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 a maybe a, a doodle poll to check it, uh, availability. And the idea on our end is we want to get all 10 members uh, available. However, if there's a scenario in which we can only get eight of you on a particular day, uh, you know, the train will continue to roll. And so we'll look uh, as best we can to be accommodating with that premise. So, uh, I see uh, Erica has her hand up. Erica, did we get any late communications from uh, uh, the public? Yes, I did. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I got one comment from Barry Willis. He is the he's on our commission and also an Alpine Fire Protection District board member. And he said, with the consultant doing thorough research for the effects on the other water districts and exit fees, would it not be very important to consult the other GMs and board members for the other two, for the other 22 water districts in a substantial way? And that was his comment. Um, and so let me just address, since A, since he's one of my bosses, Commissioner Willis's comments here. Um, uh, the role of interacting with the other 22 member agencies, I think also merits probably some discussion at the next meeting. Um, so Commissioner Willis, that's a good comment to bring up to, to LAFCO staff. So now we have a fourth item, um, at least clarifying, if not augmenting our uh, noticing and our interaction with the other 22 member agencies. Uh, so thank you, Commissioner uh, Willis, for that. And unless I see someone nodding their head in objection to that, I, I think we'd be okay. And I see legal counsel wants to jump in. What say you, Holly? Actually, I want to jump in not on that issue, but just on the general issue that I know folks um, 
I believe it might have been David in particular mentioned that, uh, you know, as they noodle some things over, they may have suggestions for what goes on the next agenda. And since this is a Brown Act committee, I would just remind everyone to send those um, suggestions directly to staff and not to copy um, any of the other members here so that we, um, and then staff will just kind of be the gatekeeper and um, and then place those items on the agenda um, that makes sense. And then at the next meeting, if to the extent those aren't on the agenda, uh, can raise those and share with the full group. So just, just to caution everybody again that we're a Brown Act committee and keep your um, communications directly with staff. Thank you, Holly. Uh, so seeing no other hands raised, I do want to, uh, again, uh, I see Tammy, hold on. You mentioned August 3rd as um, the next meeting. That's our commission meeting that day. I can't hear you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so one of the reasons why I like August 3rd is I know lack, where lack of staff will be on August 3rd, and if we could kind of roll into a committee hearing afterwards or after lunch, that would be ideal. So, uh, and I, I'm assuming like this uh, in our commission meetings until uh, the governor tells us elsewise, I assume we will be doing all business by way of Zoom. But thank you, Tammy. Sandy. Um, just one other um, comment on the um, Water Authority Act and the um, uh, LAFCO uh, legislation. Also, we need to um, include in this Standag's regional planning role. We will, uh, I will in fact coordinate with Rachel on uh, to get a, a, the utmost uh, update uh, copy of their uh, game plan. And again, as we bring this, uh, all these items to you, and again, now I have four specific agenda items, the role of consultants for reliability, water rate impacts, exit fees, and perhaps CEQA. Uh, 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 second topic being an overview from Holly of our role under CEQA and, and more uh, I think uh, uh, to the point of informing the other discussions, our role in being able to term and condition approvals, uh, a discussion from Robert on an update of the two proposals, and then the fourth, what is the committee's uh, thoughts on how we do outreach with the other 22 member uh, uh, agencies? Uh, we can um, talk at that meeting about not only future agenda items, but also and I guess I'm going to deviate a little bit. Sandy, you had made a comment about, you know, the, the selection role and, 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 and things of that. I think of how we go about selecting consultants. I think we'll work on an internal uh, draft here. I'm going to be sensitive to Holly's comment about the Brown Act. Um, but uh, if you individually, uh, uh, you know, make suggestions between the point a draft agenda is issued and then before we finalize an agenda, we can kind of cover the bases uh, that way. And again, uh, I'll ask Tammy to set up uh, or Erica a doodle uh, ca uh, poll of availability with August 3rd being the first date on my mind. But again, uh, we'll, we'll offer some alternatives if that's just not going to work with the majority of the members. So I don't see any other hands raised. I don't uh, physically or uh, on the uh, uh, Zoom uh, application. So again, Committee members, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you'll be getting some follow-up by way of email from LAFCO staff shortly. If it's not August 3rd, it will be around then. So see you soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.